Hi everyone and welcome to another Gaffering Gear. Today we're going to be looking at the SZ150R from Godox. Yes, it's another Bowens mount light, but there is a point of difference between this and other Bowens mount lights. Several points of difference in fact. Number one is it has flood spot control. It also has full DMX control and the light is also full RGBWW. In this video, we're also gonna take a look at how this light goes when it's paired up with hard source modifiers, such as Fresnel's or projection mounts. Because if you already own these modifiers, this light could represent a good gateway entry point for full RGBW point source lighting. All right, so let's go through how much it costs and what you get for your money. So it sells for 560 US dollars, which is about 815 Australian dollars. So you get this beautifully constructed bag, which is quite nicely fitted out. You get the light, of course. Uh, the light is very well constructed. I've got no criticisms of how it's constructed at all. You do get a protector for the, um, for the LEDs as well. You get a dish. Now the dish is a little bit different to what you're probably used to seeing because it is designed for flood spot capability. Okay, so not your average dish. Uh, you get the power supply, PSU. You get a power cable for that. You get a little um, harness for the power supply. So you can mount it to a light stand and this is the section that goes uh, onto the light stand which is a V-mount. Now, if anyone from Godox is watching this, please hear my plea. Sell this as a separate item. I'd buy at least 20 of them because I use these to mount my V-mount batteries to light stands. All right, so let's go through the pros and cons, starting off with the pros first. And the first pro for me is the price point, especially when you consider that this is a fully integrated RGBWW light engine. So what I mean by that is if you're using it in its CCT mode, it actually uses all of its light emitters to vector into an accurate white point. So between its uh, entire Kelvin range, 2,800 Kelvin all the way up to 6,500 Kelvin, this thing is typically only out on average by 0.0006 Delta UV, which means in layman's terms, whatever Kelvin you dial in on the back of this, you're gonna get an extremely accurate white point. The sort of white point that you'd get if you're using a light that costs $3,000 to $5,000. Now the next thing that really impresses me with this is how simple it is to use. You've got these nice big buttons here with your modes. Your master brightness is always this knob. And the other knob adjusts your parameters. So at the moment we're in our CCT mode. If I want to adjust my Kelvin, I just turn the knob, 100 Kelvin increments. If I want to change my parameter to plus minus green, I just press the button to change the parameter. Let's have a look at the HSI mode. Just press HSI and we're there. Okay, and now I'm adjusting my hues or my color vectors. If I want to change to my saturation, I just press the button to change the parameter. There's my saturation. And again, master brightness is always on this side. The next menu is effects. Let's press it and have a look. That is an icon driven menu. So just scroll to the one that you want now you do have, uh, in most of your effects modes, two or three options. So to select those options, just press the parameters button. Really is that simple. Let's have a look at the menu. This side is your remote control options or your uh, phone app options. Let's uh, scroll across to DMX here, show you how easy this is. DMX, we can turn it on and then just set our channel number. Very, very straightforward. Okay, we've got fan on and off and Bluetooth reset. That's the whole system in a nutshell. How easy is that to use? All right, so let's go through the cons. But before we do, if you're hearing a fan noise, it's not the light. I've actually got a heater running underneath the table because I am freezing tonight. All right, so let's go through the cons. And the first con is probably a big one for a lot of people. And that is the only power into this is through the DC inlet here, which is 36 volts. So that means you've got fat chance of finding a convenient battery solution for this. Now the next uh, negative I have is to do with the plus minus green. So the first thing I don't like about the plus minus green is it adjusts in an in increments of one to 50. So it doesn't go up to 100, it goes up to 50. No big deal there, but here's the thing that's really quirky with this light. If you start dimming it, watch the plus minus green values. They start going down. Now here's the thing, 
if you turn the brightness back up, you lose your plus minus green setting. Now thankfully that doesn't happen in the DMX. The next negative for me is to do with the special effects. Both manually and over DMX, you can't trigger when the effects happen. So for example, if you've got this set to lightning, it's gonna be flashing all the time. You can't give it a cue. And the next negative for me is the DMX profiling. There is only one master DMX profile. There are no combination profiles, so you don't have that level of sophistication that you'd get out of a top-end light. Now, maybe I'm expecting a bit much for a $560 light, but if you're gonna try and entice professional users with DMX, you're gonna need decent DMX profiling. All right, so let's start going over the light and first without a modifier. So as you can see here, it's got a glass dome. Now that glass dome gives you a massive amount of spread. So it would easily light a lantern or a dome, for example. So uh, let's just have a quick look at that. Now I've given you measurements here for one meter and for three meters. So at one meter, you can compare it with other lights that you might use in a softbox or a lantern. And at three meters, uh, that'll give you some idea of how, how bright this will be if you're using it to light a background. Now I forgot to mention that the flood spot is about somewhere between 120 to, I'd be guessing, uh, 160 degrees. So it, it hits the ceiling and hits the floor from this position. And I'm, a, I'm about one meter away from the wall here to give you some idea of, of scale. Now let's talk about how it floods and spots with its reflector. So it floods and spots by moving the LED array forwards and backwards. Now forwards is your flood position and backwards is your spot position. All right, so let's uh, take a look at that. Let's put it into flood first. All right, and uh, let's spot it up. Okay, so it doesn't have um, a massive uh, flood spot range on it. The difference between flood and spot in terms of brightness is a little bit under 100%. So a little bit under double the brightness in spot. So to get your expectations correct with it, in terms of how it flood spots, I would compare it to something like an old school red headlight. It doesn't give you a crisp edge on its spots. It's more of a hot spot with a big bleed off. Now, if you get a set of barn doors for it, and these are um, aperture barn doors, they do fit. Now, the barn doors won't give you um, a cut. I wouldn't call it a cut, but they will give you the same sort of spill control that you got out of an old school redhead, for example. So I think if you think of this light as an RGB WW uh, redhead light replacement for your set, I think you'll be setting your expectations at the right point. Now let's see how it goes with the Aperture 2X Fresnel. So if you're hoping that buying one of these and sticking it on the 2X will give you double the amount of light, you're gonna be bitterly disappointed. In fact, in both flood and spot, you get more light out of the reflector than you get out of the Fresnel. Now, the bad news doesn't end there. The optics uh, on this unit are what I technically refer to as shit. Now, the only good thing with this uh, attachment is you can spot it up like this and get a nice sort of uh, circle of light uh, if you want to have that in the back of your shot. So it doesn't optically align with this. Let's see how it goes with the Forza Fresnel. Now, the Forza Fresnel mount has a bigger lens, so it lines up to the LED dome a bit better. Let's take a look. Now, here's the interesting thing with this light. So that's about a 45 degree beam angle, but watch what happens when I reposition the LEDs. We can spread that out to about 60 degrees and we get barn door control. This Fresnel also gives us a nice spot with about one third more brightness than the dish. Now the shadow qualities are not as crisp as if we were using a Forza, but they're not too bad. Comparing this to other RGB Fresnels, you can see the Felix Q5 on the right has sharper cuts. And this is a comparison with the Velvet Cosmos 400 also on the right. So while this is not perfect, it is quite a usable tool. Now let's see how it goes with projection mounts. So if you're using a projector mount like this, which has a polished glass chamber and uses slide projector lenses, you're gonna get absolutely superb optics. No color fraying at all. Here, I'm lighting up one panel of my garage door from three meters away, and look at how precise the optics are. And while there is enough light level to overcome the fluorescent lighting that's in my garage, as you can see by the stats here, the brightness is very much reduced. 
Now, if you're going to use this light in combination with the aperture spotlight mount, adjust the LEDs as far forward as you can get them. That'll give you the best possible optics and the maximum brightness. Now, in terms of results, this combination is a very mixed bag. If you're going to use it with the iris as a colored follow spot, this is an absolute hero. Or if you're using it to create basic square patterns, such as using it with a reflector system, it is also going to hero. However, when you're doing fine cuts, you can get some convexing with some noticeable double shadowing. And when you defocus a fine cut, it really convexes. You also can't get a sharp gobo projection. You either have solid blacks and not everything is in focus or everything is evenly in focus and the blacks are milky. However, for out of focus background gobos, this might be perfectly fine. And to give you some idea of the creativity you can have with these limitations, this is a soft focused window pattern with the fire effect running. Now let's have a look at the DMX and I've got to say straight off, the DMX isn't the best, but let's go over how I've got it set up first. So I've got a Lumen radio receiver here, which is powering off the USB port and it is connected via an RJ45 connector. I think it's called RJ45. Now the light only has the one master profile, which is six channels. Channel one selection mode of operation. Now in the uh, DMX here, you do have one additional mode of operation, which is RGBW. So on channel one, uh, zero to 20% selects CCT, 20 to 40% selects HSI, 40 to 60% selects RGB, and 60% and above selects your special effects. All right, so let's go across to the light and have a look. So we'll start off uh, in uh, CCT mode. Now what I'm gonna do is instant turn off and turn ons and see if the light engine has any jerking. I don't know if it's my eyes, but it looks like there's, it looks like there's some sort of jerk in there. Um, I'm not sure if it's the irises in my eyes adjusting, but it looks like something's going on there. So it'd be interesting to see that played back. All right, so let's see how it goes with a five second fade. Seems to have a bit of a fall over and there's a bit of jerking in there, a bit of stepping. Okay, let's do a two and a half second fade. And fading up. Okay, let's do a one second fade. Okay, now let's change our CCT. So I'm gonna go between 2800 and 5600 Kelvin. Let's go uh, instant. Okay, let's do a five second transition. Let's transition back the other way. Okay, let's do that in two and a half seconds. And back the other way. Let's do a one second transition. And back the other way. Okay, now let's have a look at the HSI mode. So this is with no saturation and that's with 100% saturation. So I'll just go between the two and see if there's any issues with the light engine coping with that. Now let's do a five second transition. Let's go back the other way. There's some definite stepping and jerking in the light engine there. Let's have a look at two and a half seconds. And let's have a look at one second. All right, so let's go through some of the technical data I've collected, starting off with CCT averages. Between 2,800 and 4,000 Kelvin, it is out by typically plus or minus 31 Kelvin. 
between 4,100 Kelvin and 5,000 Kelvin, it is typically out by minus 65 Kelvin. And between 5,100 Kelvin and 6,000 Kelvin, it is out by on average 170 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at our TM30 color vector scores. Between 2,800 Kelvin and 4,000 Kelvin, it averaged a 93.8. Between 4,100 and 5,000 Kelvin, it was a steady 93. And between 5,100 to 6,000 Kelvin, it was 92.4. Now let's take a look at our white point accuracy in terms of delta UV, and this light is staggeringly good. Between 2,800 Kelvin and 4,000 Kelvin, it is out by on average plus or minus 0.0004 delta UV. Between 4,100 to 5,000 Kelvin, it is typically under by minus 0.0006 delta UV, and between 5,100 to 6,000 Kelvin, it is out by on average by plus 0.0008 delta UV. All right, let's put this light into party mode and have a closer look at some of our Kelvins, starting off with the lowest Kelvin we can dial in. When I dialed in 2,800 Kelvin, I got 2,752, with a TN30 color vector score of 94% color render, with an average 100% saturation. And here is the spectral distribution. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,223, with an SSI score of 84. The TN30 color vector was 94% color render with 100% average saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point is almost perfect with a delta UV score of plus 0.0002. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,325 with a TN30 color vector score of 92% color render with an average 100% saturation. The CRI scores are excellent and only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectral distribution. And the white point is almost smack on with a delta UV score of minus 0.0005. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,451, with an SSI score of 71. The TN30 color vector score was 92% color render, with an average 100% saturation. Here are the individual CRI scores. R12 is below 90, and everything else is 95+. plus. This is the spectral distribution. And the delta UV came in at plus 0.0006. So this is where it is in relation to the Planckian curve, and this is where it lies in relation to the daylight curve. When I dialed in the top Kelvin of 6,500 Kelvin, I got 6,636, with a TM30 color vector score of 91% color render and 98% average saturation. And here is the spectral distribution. Let's have a look at how it dials in its color vectors. Red, which should be zero degrees, came in at one degree. Green, which should be 120 degrees, was smack on target. Blue, which should be 240 degrees, was 241. Yellow, which should be 60 degrees, came in at 36. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, came in at 229. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, came in at 269. Now let's see how accurately it desaturates to 50%. Now at full desaturation, the light desaturates to 6,365 Kelvin. So I did my metering set to the D65 standard. Red came in at one degree with 59% saturation. Green came in at 118 degrees with 45% saturation. Blue came in at 247 degrees with 89% saturation. Yellow came in at 32 degrees with 52% saturation. Cyan came in at 230 degrees with 54% saturation. And magenta came in at 278 degrees with 76% saturation. Well, this has been a very interesting review. I'm actually glad it's over because it's been a lot of work. Next week's episode will be on the Felix Q5. See you next week.